Okay, let's turn to our Bibles to 2 Peter, and we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Three chapters, uh, hopefully we'll get through them within the next few months, but I want to take my time because they're pertinent for today, and I think that we'll, we'll really strengthen our faith and walk with Jesus Christ. Have you ever broken a promise? We all have, haven't we? In fact, statistically, they say that uh, in the Christian community, there is about 50 to 51 percent um, promises broken in marriage. 50 to 51 percent, more than the world today. They've made a commitment and a vow to one another for health, you know, or for worse. They are committed to one another, and yet 50 percent of Christians break that commitment and covenant with one another. Promises are like babies. You know, they're easy to make, but they're hard to deliver. You know, it's just hard to keep your word. There used to be a day and age where you could keep your word, where, where men made deals with a, with a handshake, you know, and their word was, was just as, as solid as a piece of paper with their signature because their word had weight to it. Uh, it meant something. And today we have to have triple copies, and even that at times isn't enough because you could take them to court and end up losing uh, because you didn't have one little word mentioned in that situation, yet the intent was to keep that commitment. A father asked his son, didn't we agree that you would try your best to study hard, son? And the son replied, yes, father, we agreed. And the father said, son, didn't we agree that if you did not, that we would spank you, son? And the son thought about it and says, father, however, since I didn't follow our agreement, it would be okay if you didn't follow your agreement. <laughs> we find those loopholes, don't we? <laughs> and not keeping our promises. Well, there's a sure promise. And that promise comes from God, and he is sure to keep his promises. I can put that in the bank, that God will keep his promises. Every promise that he has made to Israel has been kept. Every promise that he has made to the church has been kept up to this point. Every promise that he has made to myself, he's kept that promise. And there are promises that still I'm waiting for, and yet every promise that he's made to you, he will also keep. Let's break this book up a little bit as we get into it before we start into these four verses. Peter writes this second letter here in around 67 AD. Some of your Bibles might say that somewhere at the bottom, 64, 67, somewhere around there, about 34 years or so after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, written before the book of Hebrews, Jude, and 1st through 3rd John. You would call this little letter here, Peter, the apostle swan song, his final words to believers before his death by crucifixion. We find what is important to Peter before his death, kind of his last will and testament, so to speak, you know. Uh, if you're in your bed and you know that you're dying and this is it, uh, what would you say to your family? What would you say to your wife? You know, what would you say to your kids? Oftentimes we, we read uh, fathers saying, I wish I spent more time with you. I wish I said I loved you more. You know, these type of things. What would you say? Well, Peter's going to say uh, what is important to him as he realizes that his life is coming to an end. Um, oftentimes when we are at that point where life is coming to an end, we, we, we look back and we really think about the past and the things that we've done and, and how uh, successful were they, uh, where we had failed, uh, how we had fallen short, and how we wish we could have changed things if, if we had the power to go back in time and change those things. And usually it's, what, too late. We, we can't. And all we can really do is apologize to those that are around us on our deathbed. You know. and, and those that are around us will oftentimes talk about, well, what did my father, what did my mother say? You know, what were those last words? And you know, what was he thinking? I, I think of my father as, as he passed away. I, I did not have the opportunity to talk to him. He, he drove himself to the hospital and he died in the car there in the parking lot of the hospital, and so I, I did not hear any last words from him whatsoever. I oftentimes wonder, what would he have said? 
What would he have said to me or to my sisters? You know, what regrets would he have had, or or what uh, instructions, you know, before he left would he have given me? You know, and, and as the one receiving it, um, how would I respond to that? More than often, we we hear it, we we take it in, we, we think about it, but in reality, we don't necessarily change anything, do we? We don't go to our children and say, you know what, my, my father passed away or my mother passed away. They, they, they said they wished that they loved me more. Maybe I need to love my kids more. We don't act upon that part, do we? We don't think, well, maybe I need to love my kids more. Let, let me spend more time with them. You know, we don't do that. We just think about it. We reminisce about it. And really, we need to take action with it. And so Peter's going to share with us some things that are important to him. Let's go over these three chapters really quickly, just give you just a a quick summary so that you get an idea of what we're going to get into. Chapter 1, Peter writes to those who are Jewish and they do have their faith in Jesus Christ. And he writes to them about the great promises of God for them, and that is for Christians, whether you're Jew or you're Gentile. He instructs them in their faith and how to have virtue and how to have love towards one another, which is so important. And then he ends that chapter with explaining his eyewitness of Jesus Christ that like the Apostle John who had touched and felt and smelled Jesus, so Peter had a personal uh, relationship with Jesus Christ. And in chapter 2, he begins the warnings. He begins the warnings against false prophets, false teachers that will arise. He talks about the angels that uh, God would not spare and that he's going to punish as unrighteous angels because they had fallen away from the Lord. He talks about uh, the slaves of corruption that they were. And then in chapter 3, he brings up the topic of scoffers, uh, those men that don't believe that Jesus existed, that they don't believe Jesus is coming back, and they scoff at it, at his return. And he reveals to us God's heart, that God is, is not impatient but he's loving and caring that he would rather wait and and give opportunity even to the most wicked an opportunity to turn to the Lord rather than bring judgment upon the Lord and so that's why he's waiting that's why he hasn't returned yet because there's still those out there that don't know the Lord and need to come to know the Lord and then he ends with the encouragement to grow in Christ which is so important we should be growing in Christ Jesus and we'll talk about that also. David Guzik said, 1 Peter was written to encourage Christians under threat of violent persecution, whereas 2 Peter was written to warn those same believers of the dangers of false teachers and harmful influences. I was just reading an article before we got up here, and I thought, boy, I'd love to share that, and I don't know how how that article would would literally fit into, um, into the message, but now that I just read that, um, it, it fits in pretty pretty well as far as um, false teachers. You know, there are a lot of false teachers out there that profess to to know Christ, but yet they're fleecing they're fleecing Christians and believers out there. And there was an article that was written: the most the eight most richest preachers in the world. One of them was Cyrilo Dollar. You probably have heard him on TBN, Cyrilo Dollar. He's worth like $25 million. The average person in his church uh, makes $29,000. He has one jet, has a million dollar home, owns a two point something million dollar apartment in New York City. The second or, or the first minister, the richest minister is in Nigeria, believe it or not. They make less than a dollar a month. And he is the richest preacher, and he preaches on prosperity. Owns several, several million dollar homes, about three jets. Flies to London where he lives in, in various places. Uh, these are what you would call false teachers that teach a doctrine of prosperity. And we'll talk about that when we get to, to chapter 3. So um, harmful influences, and we need to be aware of those things. We need to know who we're investing in. Um, you know, the World Vision 
You know what happened there. It's a great organization. Everyone knows about World Vision, right? You, you send money into them, and they give you a little picture of a, a child, and you're supporting that child and so forth. Well, their, their CEOs make a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, when that money could be going towards these, these little children. And these are CEOs that don't spend eight hours a day you know, there. They just go there for a meeting. They make the decisions, and then they're off doing other jobs somewhere else where they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, it's just a money money racket type of thing and then on top of that which isn't a problem as much but on top of that on top of that they just literally came out and said that they are going to allow homosexual same-sex marriage within their system but then they recanted when a lot of their donators said we are going to pull out because that's not scriptural and we think that you're making a a bad mistake in your theology. And so they recanted and turned it back around. And so you see an organization like this, even though it's big, is it an organization that you should donate to? Is it an organization that you should support? Now, you might say, but what about the children? What about these poor kids that don't have a lot? At least they're going to get something. And that's one way of looking at it. I'm sure that you can probably find other means to help them out. Can you help every child out? No, you can't help every child out. But you can probably find one child out there that you can help, but not have to go through this organization. Probably help out even more than this organization. So I think we need to be aware of this and really ask for God's wisdom and understanding when it comes to these organizations, these churches that are teaching false theology, that are misleading people, that are only looking at it from a selfish perspective. Being careful of that. Some have called this little epistle here a letter of warning. There are some errors in the church and they needed to be addressed. And like any church, there's always going to be struggles in a church because you're dealing with relationships. And so people will come and go in these relationships. People will be offended and they will leave. And it's just uh, stuff that happens within churches. It's sad. It shouldn't happen, but it happens. And it's just part of our relationships with one another. Uh, Find a place where you fit in. Find a place where God has you uh, and serve there with all your heart unto the Lord. But these errors need to be corrected that come into the church. Peter is speaking well uh, to seasoned Jewish believers here. And so they know what he's talking about. They know exactly what he's talking about. Let's go ahead and read those verses and then we'll, we'll break it up. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Boy, we can read that several times. There's just so much there. Uh, I literally could have started with just the first verse, but I want to try to get through as much as I can. Peter here is speaking to the believers in verse 1. And he starts off by saying, Simon Peter. He uses his old name, Simon, first, and then he says, Peter. We know that his name was Simon, and then we know that Jesus named him Peter. There was a reason for that. It it speaks of someone's new nature. You know, this is who you were in the past. This is who you are now in the future. Uh, It's a type of, uh, of... relationship that we have with Christ. It's signifying that that we should be changing, we should be growing, we should be different than what we were when we first started in Christianity. There's a point in life where you accept Christ Jesus into your heart and then he begins to sanctify you, he begins to work in you. You start letting go of the old life, letting go of those old beliefs, the things that you once thought was right and true. Uh, God illuminates your mind, your heart towards sin and you realize these things are wrong and I shouldn't be doing them anymore and you start walking forward with the Lord, you're growing. And so he says, I was Simon, but now I am Peter. I'm a changed man. And in a sense, he's reminiscing, probably reminiscing about his old life, you know, uh, thinking about where he came from as Simon, uh, maybe all the struggles he had. I, you know, as an old guy, you, you, you happen to do that. You, 
oftentimes talk about your past. You know, sit around a bunch of old people. What do they talk about? Their past. You know, the, the, when they were younger. Oh, when I was young, I did this. Or when I was, you know, in sports, this is what I used to do. And, you know, and, and so forth. And so Peter's probably thinking about those things. You know, may possibly thinking about how he denied the Lord. And, and yet here he is now, an old guy, and he's ready to be crucified for the Lord. You know, what a big change. What a big difference. You can see the evidence of his faith in God. And so he's reminiscing about that old life sinfulness. Uh, has there been growth in your life? Can, can you see growth in your life from last year, even from the beginning of this year? Do you see that your thoughts have changed a little bit? Maybe your actions have changed? You know, every year I ask the Lord to help me uh, with my uh, growth with him. You know, Lord, help me to, to maybe learn a few more verses that I can apply to my life. Maybe help me change a few things in my life that uh, I need to change. You know, help me to constantly grow in you. When I first got saved, I was really concerned that I would not stick with it because I was, I was very much a type, and I still am, a, a type A personality. You know those type A people, I mean, they're just, they get focused, they just, they want to do it, and they want to do it now, and they want to do it to an extreme, and that's just how I am. But I saw that when I do do that, that there comes a point where I get bored of it and then I just put it up on a shelf. You know, so if I got into um, soccer, you know, I would buy all the soccer gear, the shirts, the jerseys, the shoes, the socks, everything, and the ball, the greatest balls, the best balls, and I'd go out there and just give it all, and then all of a sudden I get bored and I put it up on the shelf. Baseball do the same thing. I got bags of baseballs, I mean weight balls, balls that you can throw that have weights so that when you throw the literal ball, it feels like it's nothing when you're throwing it. You know, I got into it. You get into it. Just how I am. And I thought to myself, uh, am I going to do that with Christianity? You know, here, uh, I've accepted Christ. My life has just changed drastically. But is there a point where all of a sudden I'm going to get bored? Am I going to get tired of it and then just walk away from it? And so I was really concerned with that. And so uh, every year uh, I asked the Lord uh, to help me not get bored, to help me stick with it, to help me grow every year. And so for 27 years now, 26, 27 years now, he has been faithful to keep me going on the same path. You know? And we need to keep praying that. You should be growing as believers. If you're not growing, you know, something's wrong. Some, you're not doing something. You're not applying yourself to the scriptures through prayer, through fellowship. You're not getting involved because that's where you grow is through um, application of the word. God has done great things through Peter and he's reminiscing. Now, he calls himself a bondservant. So after Simon Peter, he calls himself a bondservant. You know, I hear Christians uh, quite often, uh, I see them posted or, or Christians say, I'm a child of God. You know, do you know what they're saying when they say, I'm a child of God? They're not saying it with humility. There's a difference there. When, when someone says, I'm a child of God, that means I've got rights, I've got power, he's my daddy, you better be careful what you do to me because he's up there. And they're all true, but the attitude of arrogance behind it is what's wrong. See, Peter didn't say, I'm a child of God. He said, I'm a bondservant of God. I'm a servant of God. Not bad for someone who fell three times to all of a sudden now understand that, that I'm just a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In other words, I have freely decided to serve God with all my heart, soul, and strength. Now, when I say that, we oftentimes think of Mother Teresa. You know, she is committed to serve God with her whole life. And she was, apparently, you know, she gave her whole life, uh, celibates and, and so forth, the whole thing to God. You know, and you think of a minister, you think of a, an evangelist, and they're sold out. But, but Peter is talking about all of us here. We're all to be sold out to Christ. We're all to be bondservants of Jesus Christ. Every one of us, we should be sold out to Christ. We should have a desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. Doesn't mean that you have to give your life and go to Africa and forsake everything. What it means is you serve them right where God has you. You serve your husbands, you serve your wives, you serve your children, you serve your community, you serve in your churches. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no higher calling than to serve. Jesus himself said that I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. And so there is no higher calling but to serve. And yet we miss that. We should have hearts to serve. 
Yes, it's hard. It's hard doing dishes. You know, it's very difficult washing those dishes. Uh, I know that because of my eating habits now, I, I try to cook my food, and as I'm cooking it, uh, I'm washing the dishes and putting them away right there on the spot. It's so much easier doing that than let them piling up and having a hundred dishes to wash. You know, just just figuring out ways of doing it because you get bored of doing it the old-fashioned way or cutting the grass. One thing I hate, I hate rounding up weeds. You know, they, they, they sell this concentrated Roundup. You put it in a container, and you pump it up, and it sprays out the Roundup, and you just walk around and you spray the weeds. That way you don't have to pull them you don't have to cut them down but for some reason i hate doing that and every time i think about doing it i push it off and sometimes i'll push it off for like a week okay i gotta do it no not today tomorrow tomorrow and it's such the simplest thing to do it's not difficult you know so i ask myself why do you hate it so much because it's saving you time you know you're killing the weeds you don't have to bend down you don't have to pick them up your your yard it looks nice when you when you do it and maintain it. If you don't do it, what happens? Weeds grow like huge. Then you gotta get cut them down, and then you gotta you know pull. It's just ridiculous. For some reason, I hate that, and I ask myself why. You know why? Because the enemy does not want us to be servants. For some reason, it's easier to do nothing than it is to do something. It's easier just to lay around and justify that, hey, you know, I deserve to just lay around than to literally get up and do something. Why is it that we can't get up? And get a glass of water, guys. And we say, honey, can you give me a glass of water? How hard is that? And yet we don't want to do it. You know, hey, can you grab that over there on the counter for me? Well, it's right there. Why don't you grab it yourself? You know, but it's so hard because the enemy really wants to keep us from being servants. And yet the Bible teaches so much on it. Paul said in Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See, we're called to freedom. In other words, freedom from sin, not freedom to enjoy ourselves or to be served. Now, I understand that it's nice to be served once in a while and to be pampered. You know, you go away and you get your nails done, you get your hair done, and you're, it's my time, you know, or you got your man cave and your TV and you're going to relax and just, you know, do nothing, you know. I understand that, but... It's not opportunity for the flesh. It's an opportunity to serve and to love one another. That's how you know if you love one another. Are you growing in that? How do I know if I'm growing in that? Because you're serving one another, and that means you're loving one another. Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. Not like the Gentiles, not like other people, Jesus said, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Jesus said greatness is being a servant. I think we're going to see a lot of people that, that served here doing minimal things in heaven having a great positions because they were servants. Compared to me standing behind a pulpit, you know, being up there, I'm going to probably be serving, which I don't have a problem. At least I'm in heaven. <laughs> you know, I'll be there. But Jesus said serving is the greatest thing to do. It's the greatest Above everything else. Well, I thought the presidency would be the greatest. No. No, being the janitor would be the greatest of the president. That's the greatest job right there. And Jesus came to do that. Good leaders must become good servants, Robert Greenleaf said. Good leaders must become good servants. So many people want to, to lead, but they don't want to serve. Give me a position and a place so I can direct people on what to do, but I don't want to do it myself. I had a guy years ago in here that wanted to be an assistant pastor, but he didn't want to clean. He didn't want to serve. I says, come on, come on down Sunday mornings and help us set up. Help us set up. Sweep out the bathrooms, you know, empty the trash cans. At that time, we were a lot smaller, and so I used to do it myself with another couple of guys, you know. And so I asked him to come. He just walked around with me the whole time just talking with me while I was doing the work. He doesn't want to serve. He, he wants the position to lead, you know. And that's not the way it goes. When you look at the Bible, uh, William Barclay said Moses, who was the greatest, uh, greatest leader of all, the lawgiver of the law, he was a doulos. The word doulos means servant, and that's the bond servant that Peter's talking about. Yet he was a servant of God. Joshua, who was a great commander of the army of the Lord, and yet the Bible says he was a doulos, a servant of God. David also, who was the greatest king of all, and yet he was a servant of God. And then we come to the New Testament, Paul, uh, 
and we know the great work that he has done, writing two-thirds of the New Testament, and yet he was a doulos, a great servant of God. James and Jude, same thing along with Peter. We're bondservants of Jesus Christ. And so Peter and Paul esteem this term doulos very highly. The word picture... The word pictures here an absolute surrender of a man or woman to their master. That's what the word pictures, is that you're willing to say, Lord, I am your slave, because that's what the word means. And it means you voluntarily give yourself to God. And so when you are a slave, you have no rights. You have no benefits when you really think about it. And so if God asks you to serve your wife, you're to serve your wife. And if God asks you to serve your husband, you're to serve your husband. Now, I understand the whole feminist movement. I understand the whole equal rights. But we need to understand what the Bible says, what it truly says about servanthood. And I come from a tradition uh, that has passed from generation to generation where I have seen my aunts and my great aunts and my grandmothers serving their husbands the food. And the husbands would sit down and they would bring them the plates and sit there. That's servanthood. Now, I understand that there's this negative to that. Well, how dare they? Can't they get up and do their, you know, they could. But the attitude that the women had back then is an attitude of servanthood. And we've lost that completely. Uh, We're destroying ourselves because of it. Because it doesn't stop there. If it it stops there, it'd be nice. But it doesn't stop there. It, it, It spans into everything now. You know, and it has affected us as a people and even in our relationships with one another uh, because we don't know how to serve one another. The slave is totally devoted to his loving master and it is the slave's love for the master which motivates their full surrender. See, when you're in love with Jesus, when you know what he's done for you and you're in love with him, you're going to serve him. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'll do it. You know, so many of men who have started Calvary chapels, started by cleaning toilets, you know, and they got on their hands and knees wiping those toilets and cleaning them and cleaning out the restrooms and making sure they were supplied. Why? Because they loved the Lord and they just wanted to serve and they weren't doing it for the people, they were doing it for God and that's what kept them going and their pastors today who preach the word of God as 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 passionately as they put the roll of paper on the on the little spool there for people to use. Ben Franklin said, he that cannot obey cannot command. That is so true. Peter also says an apostle. Now notice the the order here. First it's a bondservant and then it's an apostle. You know that status, apostleship and so forth is second to bondservant. We need to understand that. It's servant first and a servant's heart that God looks at before he looks at anything else. And Peter got it there. He says, I am an apostle, secondly. Now, apostle means a messenger, a one who is sent. God has sent Peter out with the gospel message. And, Jesus, uh, and it's of Jesus Christ, the anointed Messiah. So in a sense, Peter was saying, I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ, sent by him with all the credentials uh, to perform signs and miracles, on a mission, proclaiming the gospel message, the good news of salvation to all lost men is what Peter is saying, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting here. To those who obtain, in other words, received by lot, it, it, those who have been called by God into a relationship with God. Now, when does that happen? When you encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have a choice to be called by God. God calls out to you and says, repent, turn from your sins and your old life, come to me, give yourself to me, and I will give you a new life. That is when you are called, that is when you have obtained what Peter calls precious faith. With us, that is, with Peter, in other words, all of us, we're all believers here, we all have that same precious faith in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, and it is by his righteousness, that is, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter says here, our God and Savior Jesus Christ, speaking of his deity, our God and Savior. Who saved us? Jesus Christ. So Peter acknowledged the deity of Jesus Christ himself. And so the letter was to all believers who have the same sincere faith in Jesus Christ. This is not for the religious person. 
If you're here because you think I have to be in church to please God, you're wrong. It's not for the religious person. If you think you're here because you have to do a work to receive something from God, you're wrong. That's religion. If you're here because you love God and you want to please God and you want to continue on in that relationship and hearing from God on a regular basis. And that's why we meet every Sunday of every week. This is not for the religious person that depends upon his own righteousness, but on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not for those who wish, who wished that by their works they could somehow please God because they can't. Nor for those who... Um, depend upon their own ways and understandings. It's for those who have a unique spiritual experience with Jesus Christ. It's for those who are, what the Bible says, born again. That you were born of the Spirit now. That you have left the old life and you are a new creature in Christ Jesus and the old things have passed away and behold, all things are new. That's who Peter's speaking to. And he's saying, and we are just like you. We understand that. And not only do we understand it, we acknowledge it and we can see it because we experienced it too there. So Peter uses that word obtain or receive by lot. And this verse speaks of the salvation he and his readers obtained as a result of their personal, as their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so like Peter, we have all obtained that precious faith of ours. I like the way John MacArthur said it. I don't, know, I don't agree with John MacArthur all the time, but, but I like the way he, he said this. He says, faith like grace is not static. Saving faith is more than just understanding the facts and mentally complying. It's more than that. It, 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 you think that the devils believe, but they fear and they tremble because they don't have a relationship with God. And so it's more than just a mental compliance. It is inseparable from repentance, surrender, and a supernatural longing to obey. None of these responses can be classified exclusively as human works. See, there's an inerrant nature that God puts in you that hungers and thirsts for righteousness, that hungers to be active in the kingdom of God. That's who Peter is talking about. That's the precious faith that he's mentioning here. You know, some have doubted Peter even wrote this letter. But when you read just that section there, precious faith, and you go back to 1 Peter, how many times has he used the word precious? Many times in that book, and we looked at it while we were there. And yet now he uses it again for precious faith. And so you see that Peter is the author here. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to Christ surrendering your will to him and having that like precious faith with him if you're willing to commit yourself to him now look at verses four or two through four as God's precious promises obtained through the knowledge of Jesus Christ now this is where it gets a little difficult and so hang on and and we'll get through this grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord now that's almost a prayer of Peter. You know, I want grace and peace to you and it let it be multiplied or let it be full. And you have a cup half empty. I want it to be full towards you. That's his heart towards you. But it comes in the knowledge that is the recognized recognized knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And so he's praying for that favor and peace of God to come upon all believers through the knowledge. Now it's through the knowledge that we understand that that comes. And so where does knowledge come from? And we'll see through Peter uh, as we go through the book that that knowledge comes from the Word of God, reading the Word of God. And so we need to be in the Word of God daily, getting nourishment and understanding of who God is. When you know who God is, there's power there for your life. Because no matter what struggle you go through, you know God's with you. You know God is faithful. You know God is true to His Word. You know that God will help you through those times. The more knowledge you have of Jesus Christ, the better or the greater understanding that you'll have of our God's true grace. And what's the result? Peace. Peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding. That word peace there means that which is separate or to join together. It just brings everything together. There's just the harmony of, of, of the presence of the Lord and, and what God is doing in your life through the grace of God that is the favor of God in your life. Now why don't we have peace? 
because you haven't fully surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by not seeking the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there's an unrest. That's why we don't have peace. We haven't surrendered to him completely. Peter writes to encourage the believers with the grace and peace of God, but it will only be abstract knowledge added to my intellectual understanding if we don't experience an intimate relationship with Jesus which will reach the very core of our hearts with that peace. We've got to have a relationship with Christ. And it's got to be intimate. And it's got to be deep. It's not superficial. We're not here to just hear the word and say that was wonderful. They, they did that with Jeremiah and they walked away and did not do anything. We're here to talk about our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. Who is Jesus? What has he done? How did he do it? How did he show us he loved us? What did he do for us on that cross? You know, all those things are important for us so that we can have that peace in this life. And not only grace and peace, but look at verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Again, those things are given to us by the knowledge of Him who called us. So the knowledge is important of understanding who He is, what He has done. When you go back to the Old Testament and you see how God created the heavens and the earth, is there anything impossible for God to do? No. No. He can take nothing and create it into something. Now, and I find that interesting because the word created there in the, in the book of Genesis is bara, and it means nothing. That God literally took nothing and made something out of it. And I find it interesting that the devil will take that same thought and, and he will say the world existed through a bang. Well, where did the bang come from? And the world says from nothing. You know, from a little period, you know, a little dot. And, and all of a sudden a dot became so powerful and forceful that Boom, it blew up and created the whole universe. What a lie. What a lie. Because they took the same truth, mixed it up, and gave it, the, you know, gave it a evolutionist theory. It was God who took nothing and spoke it, and it became. That's our God. And if you believe that, boy, your worries are taken care of. He can do anything. And then you start to see what he does in the lives of the believers. He saw what he did with Noah, how he saved his life through the whole flood and through the whole chaotic world system at that time that they were devouring one another, hating one another. You know, and then you see Moses, you know, taking him to the Red Sea, the, the ocean there, and it divides it, and they were saved. And you just have one after another. God just shows how powerful he is. Now, notice the words, his divine power. That's a Jewish phrase. Jews are not allowed to use God's name. They believe that it's blasphemy. Who are we to even speak his name? So they would say things like this, his divine power, speaking of God, his power, his greatness. He has given us all things that pertain, and the word pertain there is in the direction of what? Direction of what? Those things that pertain to life and godliness, two things. Life itself. Jesus has given us eternal life. He has given us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ what he has done on the cross. And if we believe and put our heart and surrender it to him, we have eternal life. And not just eternal life, but also sanctification of life. Those things that pertain to life, the godliness in life. He's given us the power to live that godly life through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That what? Our flesh has been crucified. That we have power in God to deny ourselves. We don't realize that though. And so we continue to live our life as though we have no power. We're living powerless as Christians. It's amazing how we struggle. Now, Paul struggled too, and I'm not coming down on, on us at all. Please don't misunderstand that. What I'm trying to get at is that God has power for us. It's available, and we have access to it, and we want to tap into that so that we can live that life and that godliness that he wants us to have. Now, Paul wanted that too. In fact, he realized that it comes through Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 7, you know, he said, the things that I don't want to do, you know, that it's sinful and it's wrong and I shouldn't be doing it, he goes, I find myself doing it. Now, now I understand that. I know exactly what he's saying there. As a believer, there are things that I don't want to do. I, I want to be patient. 
I want to be more loving. I don't want pride. And yet I find myself prideful, impatient, you know, and not loving as much. Yeah. I want to be those things, and yet I can't do it, like Paul said. And then he goes on, he says, and then the things I want to do, or I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Yeah. And so he ends off in chapter 8, he says, so how is this wretched body going to be delivered? And he said, thank be to God. It's through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's through Christ, because there's no condemnation in Christ, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's the first point in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, is there's no condemnation. You're not condemned. You have eternal life, and it's through Jesus Christ. So know that. So the things that we struggle with are our flesh or the enemy that comes in, and so we have to learn how to battle the enemy and battle our flesh through Christ Jesus. And that's what Peter is saying here. John Piper said this, another man that I don't necessarily always agree with, but he puts this pretty well. Uh, the Christian faith is not merely a set of doctrines to accept. It is the power to be experienced. It is a tragic thing to ask people if they know the Lord and have them start listing things they believe about the Lord. Brothers and sisters, believing things about Jesus Christ will save no one. The devil's are the most orthodox believers under heaven. It is divine power that saves. It is the power of God does not flow into your life and make you godly. You are not Christ. All who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, Romans 8, 14. The mark of sonship is divine power. The mark of power is godliness which means a love for the things of god and a walk in the ways of god that has to bring that question where is my power am i walking in the things of god do i have that power to live that godly life peter speaks of the way god intends for man to live he, li he intends for us to live like adam and eve that were in the garden with in harmony with god before the fall that's God's whole purpose is to bring us back to that unity and relationship that he had with us in the very garden himself. It would be kind of like a story that I, I, I read about Crowfoot. He was an Indian there in the uh, Blackfoot Nation of South Albert, Alberta. The Canadian wanted to put a railroad through and so they made a deal with him and he says, I'll, I'll take it. He had a free pass to ride the railroad uh, anytime he wanted to. So he took that pass, put it around his neck, and he never wrote it. <laughs> but he had the pass. You know, it was a great deal f for him, I guess, but he never wrote it. And, and that's how we are sometimes. You know, we have great passes um, of God, great power of God, and yet we never use it. We never seek God uh, to help us to have victory over these things. You know, you're struggling with something. Why aren't you asking God for help? Why aren't you getting on your face and asking the Lord to deliver you, to give you power to overcome these things so that we can hit, live a life of godliness? Someone said godliness is not talking godly, but it's living godly. And there are a lot that just talk godly, but they don't live godly. Alex Der McLean wrote this, we may, have a, we, we, we may have as much of God as we want, Christ puts the key of the treasure chambers into our hands and bids us to take all that we want. If a man is admitted into the billion-dollar vault of a bank and told, the, told to help himself, and he comes out with one cent, whose fault is that? It's the man's fault. So we need to help ourselves with, with everything that God has for us. <clears throat> How? How do we grow? How do we gain that knowledge? Well, again, it's through prayer and through the Word of God on a daily basis. It's really that simple and you know, obviously worshiping the Lord too. And yet we don't do it. And it goes back to that servant attitude, right? Why is it that we don't do those simplest things? Can you take my shoes off? You know, Can't you take your own shoes off and get your own slippers? You know, uh, Why is it that we struggle with those things? It's because the enemy and our flesh. And yet we need to be in the word of God. We need to be praying and asking God for that power on a daily basis. And he goes on in verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And so Peter reminds us of the promises that have been given to us by God. 
The psalmist in 138.2 reminds us that God honors his word even above his own name. We never have to doubt the promises of God. Instead, we should let God be true and let every man be a liar. That God will keep his promises to us. He kept them to Israel and he's going to keep them to us as a Gentile church and he will keep the promises to you. He has to me. There's a promise that God has given to myself, and I'm going to come out and just publicly announce it, and so now God's going to be (laughs) have to do it, or I'm a liar, I guess, Um, but something that my wife and I, as we were praying years ago, and we were just seeking the Lord, and the Lord gave us a vision that this little church would would multiply, and she actually saw a field uh, of harvest, you know. Not harvest, not harvest over there, but just a field. Maybe that's what it was, a field and there's harvest. <laughs> that was the vision. <laughs> but that, you know, the Lord was just going to use it, you know. Now, what I love about the Lord, he doesn't give you all the little details. You know, I wish he'd write a contract down and hear the details. It all, you know, because he didn't say it was me <laughs> or my wife. You know, he just said this church, you know, and what was the work that was being done here. So maybe me, maybe come in the future, who knows? You know, but there's a promise there, and and we continue to look to that promise. It gives us hope, and that's what keeps us going, because God promised that to us. And that's a personal promise. Someone said God sends every bird his food, but he doesn't throw it right into his nest. Yeah, We have to get out there and, and, you know, pray for it and seek it and have God deliver it. He goes on and says that through these you may be partakers of, of the divine nature. Now there's a beautiful promise that if we surrender ourselves to God, we can partake of his divine nature. Those cute communicable characteristics, you know, like love. God is love. And we can partake of that promise that he has given us love, to love one another, to serve one another. Feelings and emotions. God has those feelings and emotions for us. You know, Um, that we can partake of. And that's what Peter is talking about here, of all the promises towards us, is that we can be brought back into the image of God, that God created us in the very beginning, even with free will itself like God. That's a promise of God. You have free will. God has given that to you as a promise. And so when we exercise it, it's because of God's grace that we can exercise that free will. We need to exercise it for the glory of God. That's what his original plan was. And then Peter uh, makes it very clear, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Having escaped, the word escapes means fleeing from. And so he's encouraging the believers there now as he gives this introduction to Second Peter that remember, you have escaped the corruption that it's in this world through the desires and the passions of your life. You've escaped those things. You might still be involved in them, but God has a way out of those passions and desires. And there are so many temptations in this world today, and many people are falling because of those temptations, whether it's the love of money. And people will do whatever it takes for the love of money. They'll deny the Lord for the love of money. They'll work on Sundays for the love of money. They won't give to the Lord because of the love of money. These are the passions and desires of life, the the love of... what, What do we passion here in America? It's so different from... Africa, you know, or one of these India and and so forth. These people are are desiring just to eat and have a roof over their head. Here, we're, you know, the poorest have cell phones and and cable, you know, and this is their passion and desire in life. These are the things that Peter is talking about. We've escaped those things. In other words, let's set priorities. Let's understand what priorities are. God has given us power over sin. And so let's set those priorities to serve him and him first. Let me close. When you trust Christ, he gives you all that you need for life and godliness. All that you need. And all you have to do is appropriate what you need from his resources through prayer and through his word. And he will keep his promises.
Have you trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Have you truly surrendered your heart to Him? If you haven't, let's bow our heads and let's surrender right now to Him completely. There's things in our lives. You know, I can take a step of faith here and say there are things in your life right now that are keeping you from experiencing God's power and strength. You know, those lusts. It's something in the world that you're lusting after. Something that you see. Something that you feel. And these are things that that keep you from the Lord. Father, we come before you, Lord. And we give you glory and honor for who you are. We acknowledge that you sit upon the throne and that you have all power and might and authority, Lord, over us. And we are your bondservants in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray right now, Lord, from our hearts, Lord. And we want to pray in sincerity, Lord, that you would help us to surrender ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, here we are. Would you receive us, Lord? And would you help us to have the right perspective and make the right decisions, Lord? Father, help our hearts, Lord, to be hearts of servants, Lord, like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would be just like him, Lord. He was totally surrendered to you, Lord. And he was totally a servant, Lord. He gave his life for us, Lord. Lord, help us to give our lives to one another, Lord. We surrender to you now, Lord. We make that our will, Father. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.